If there is an immediate threat to human life or property and normal communications aren't available, anyone in the U.S. can pick up a ham radio and try to get help. One of the five primary reasons the amateur radio service even exists in the U.S. is because it's a voluntary, non-commercial means of communication, especially valuable in times of emergency. I'm going to be talking about emergency communications today, preparing for an emergency, and different levels of preparedness. I hope you find this interesting. Let's get going. I'm going to lay out several different scenarios, different levels of preparedness to be able to communicate in case there's an emergency. When I talk about emergency, I'm talking about cell phones being out. Landlines, in or out, I don't know because I don't have a landline, so no access to landlines. Power, either out or unreliable. And internet where you are, either unavailable or unreliable. So I'm not going to be talking about digital voice like DSTAR and DMR or services like Echolink because those rely on the internet uh, to operate at least effectively. But all of those can be very effective if the internet is available. They can be very useful in emergencies. Let's talk about the most basic, lowest level of preparedness to be ready to communicate in an emergency. In this scenario, the person's doing the responsible thing. They're preparing themselves, their family, their household for an emergency situation. They read lots of articles, they watch lots of YouTube videos, and they create a checklist for themselves of things to prepare. And on that list is emergency communications. They go online, they buy an inexpensive handheld ham radio, they charge it, they turn it on to make sure it works. They put it in their emergency bag, and then they check that off their list. Unfortunately, this person is still completely unprepared to use a radio like this in an emergency, either to receive emergency information or to call out and try to get help. Without knowing how to use the radio, without having it programmed, without having any real knowledge of how to go about using this, in an emergency, you're not gonna have time to learn on the go. So this person, while maybe not completely useless, it's as close as it can possibly get. They have a radio, but no idea how to use it. Let's move one step up. In this scenario, the person buys the exact same radio, but they read the instruction manual. They learn that the radio can receive FM broadcast radio stations, like the ones you get in your car. They learn how to do that on the radio. They dial in the local news station, and now, they can receive real-time news using the radio. That's great. They also learn that the radio can receive weather 24 hours a day, seven days a week from NOAA, the federal agency who deals with weather. They transmit on 10 different frequencies and no matter where you are in North America or, or at least the US, you should be in range of one of those and be able to get real-time weather updates, alerts, and forecasts. Great, this person is prepared to receive information, emergency information, with their radio. They go a step further. They visit radioreference.com and they find the frequencies for police, fire, and rescue in their area. They tune in those frequencies, but all they hear is noise. And that's because their local fire and police have upgraded to digital radios and an analog radio won't be able to decode those. If this person lived in an area where police and fire still used analog radio, they would be able to listen to police and fire traffic. But it might be a surprise when an emergency happens and they go to call the police on those frequencies to find out that their radios are not allowed to transmit on those frequencies. They go a step further and they find frequencies for local amateur radio ham repeaters and they program those into the radios and they listen and eventually they hear some ham radio guys chit-chatting and they think, wow, great, okay, I'll be able to ask for help on these frequencies. But without going a little further and finding out that most repeaters work on two different frequencies, uh, one on receive, one on transmit, and some require a special tone under your voice to actually 
activate the repeater without learning that, without properly programming the radio, they're very unlikely to be heard unless they have a neighbor within a mile or so, a mile or two, that's monitoring that repeater, that person might be able to hear a transmission, but the transmission that they make on the repeater won't be repeated over a wider area. In this scenario, you are prepared to receive emergency information real time through weather, NOAA weather broadcasts and FM radio broadcasts. You might be prepared to transmit on repeaters, but the likelihood of you being able to call out and get help is pretty low. I'm going to go to another scenario, and this is what I would consider to be the basic level you'd need to be at to have a good chance of communicating during an actual emergency. You do everything the other, in the other two scenarios. You buy the radio, you program it to receive FM broadcast and, and weather, and you program in some ham repeaters, but the next step would be getting your amateur radio license. In the US, an amateur radio license is free, for now, and it lasts for 10 years. You do have to pass a multiple choice test, but all the questions in the pool, along with the answers, are published. So you can study the questions and answers, or you can take classes online. There's YouTube videos, there's books, tons of ways to pass the multiple choice test. Now, I said earlier that anyone can use a ham radio in the case of a life or death situation or an immediate threat to property, but when you have your license, you can transmit anytime you want. And this is important for a couple reasons. First is you can transmit if you have a non-life or death emergency situation. Let's say you were out hiking and your phone got wet or ran out of batteries or you lost it and you want to get a message to your family, let them know you're all right and when you're going to be home and that your phone's not working. You could probably do that using a ham radio. If your car uh, battery was dead and you wanted to jump, uh, I would be totally comfortable calling out on ham radio, seeing if there was anyone close by that could give me a jump. So a lot of little emergency situations that you can use a ham radio to get some help. You also get an opportunity to practice and practice with a radio is pretty important. I mean, I often forget how to use some of the features on some of my radios because I haven't used them in a while. Although that may be because I have too many radios. Yeah, that's probably it. But practice is important. You have to be prepared. You know, part of preparing is making sure you're able to use the equipment properly and that it's programmed in the right way. You also get experience on nets, and nets are like conference calls for hams that are moderated. And the moderator is called the net control operator. And in my experience, what I've heard when severe weather rolls through, or there's another type of emergency, usually around weather, I haven't heard any real emergencies, but in the case of weather emergencies, uh, hams will form a net on one or more of the more popular repeaters in my area and the net control operator will do a couple key things. First, they will update live, real time, weather information, watches and warnings or where particularly severe weather is and where it's heading. They'll be gathering that information either from a radio broadcast or TV broadcast or the internet depending on where they are. They'll also pause the net and ask if there's any emergency traffic. This is where you would ask if you actually had an emergency, uh, you would be able to call in and ask for help at that point. The net control operator also asks for people to call in with real-time damage reports or road closures or anything on the super local level. The net control operator will ask for that information and then share it amongst the entire net. So when you have practice, when you understand how nets work, and you've heard a few, you'll be better prepared to use a net in case of an emergency. Next scenario, the next step up from being prepared to communicate in an emergency would be to join your local amateur radio club. You might think I'm crazy, but stick with me. Ham radio is a community, especially in the local level, and getting to know people through the club and being active in the club, I think is an important part of being prepared to get help in an emergency. And I'm gonna give you an example of why this could be important to you. Um, it happened before I was licensed, but there was a huge snow and ice storm here in Atlanta and a lot of cars stuck in ditches, a lot of people stuck on the roads. Well, I know there were a few hams out in four by fours or on four wheelers 
helping people, either get their car out of the ditch or just picking them up and taking them home. Now imagine you were a ham out in the snow, in the ice, helping fellow hams. Great thing, but that's a very limited resource. You get a call from someone five miles south, a call sign you've never heard before, they got a car stuck in a ditch, they're asking for help. You wanna help that person, but there's also a call from someone five miles north, and this person you know, you recognize the call sign. They're in the club, you've done club things together, club activities. You've talked to this person on the repeater many, many times. Who are you gonna help first? And then if by that time now you're 10 miles away, so you might not get help. So having more friends in the area, having people you know and have done things with, I think it just makes you more likely when there's very limited help resources to be able to get help. Now I'm not saying that hams are you know, only gonna help people in the club. Hams are a friendly group of people and they will try to help everyone. I'm just saying that if you're part of their club, if you're part of your group, if they know you, you're more likely to get the help you need when you need it. Wow, so we've covered a lot. Let's go one more level up and let's talk high frequency radio, HF radio. Now, to get to this level of preparedness, you would need to take another amateur radio test to upgrade your license to at least general. You would also need to invest a bit more money in a more expensive radio, an antenna setup, maybe an antenna tuner, and probably some kind of backup power solution, whether that be batteries or solar charging for those batteries or a generator, something that would allow you to communicate on HF for a longer time period. Why is this important? Well, with a handheld ham radio like this, you can reliably talk if the repeaters stay up or if you can get some altitude over your local area, your town, your county, or maybe a metro area like Atlanta, okay? But if your region is struck with an emergency, let's say the entire southeast of the U.S. is suffering in an emergency situation, well, I might need to be able to talk to people outside of that situation. And that's where HF radio comes in. I know that with my HF radio, I can go out and set it up and within 15, 20 minutes, be talking to people on the other side of the continent, reliably talking to people all over the US and Southern Canada, and sometimes Europe and South America. And my system runs on a battery with solar charging capability. So unless the sun stops shining, I'll be able to communicate for quite a while. Now think about a scenario where, like I said, an entire region is hit with an emergency and no one has communications. Well, in that case, if there's communications exist outside of my area, there's a good chance that I could ask somebody to forward a message to my family who are also outside of the area and get that message to my family. That's a possibility with HF radio. So if you want to be able to communicate beyond your local area, beyond your metro area, you're going to have to go with HF. This is the level I'm at. I didn't get into ham radio for emergency preparedness reasons, but I'll tell you, it's a really nice side benefit. It's a nice side benefit of having the tools and the ham radio skills that I know if there were an emergency, I would absolutely be able to talk to people and ask for help in my area, outside of my area, and possibly other parts of the world. Final scenario, the top level. These are the folks that use their amateur radio skills and tools to help other people. And if that sounds interesting to you, well then you'll want to join one of the emergency radio services or clubs or organizations. These clubs, organizations, they work with local governments, hospitals, first responders to develop emergency communication plans. And then they train, drill, practice, deploying, setting up, and being ready in case there is an emergency. The two main organizations that I'm aware of are Aries and Races. Aries is Amateur Radio Emergency Service, and we have a local chapter here. Races is Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, and I know the clubs kind of have the same type of mission. I went to an Aries drill that they had last year, and it was fascinating. They deployed five or six stations around the metro Atlanta area. I went to the central one. It was nice. It was set up on a hill in a parking lot. They had great elevation, great line of sight to most of the metro area. They had a generator set up, multiple radios, multiple antennas, and computers. 
the remote stations were set up somewhat in the same way. Now what they were doing is the remote stations were simulating, gathering reports, and they would gather those reports digitally or enter them into their computer. Then they would bundle them and they'd wait for the central station to call them and say, hey, are you ready to send your reports? They would say yes. And then they would send those reports over the air digitally. And then they did it for the next station and the next and the next. Then what the central station did was bundle all of those reports and send them up to a regional station. And that regional station, then it went up and up until it got to the national. I think they were working with the Red Cross on that particular drill. The reason they were using digital is because digital is great for that type of communication because it's sort of all or nothing, right? You either get all the reports as written, as entered, or you don't. And if you're using voice communications to transmit emergency information, letters can be misheard, can be written down wrong, or numbers can be written down wrong, and it could make that communication useless. So they use digital. Now the reports could have been anything. It could have been casualty reports, evacuation reports, hospital occupancy, you know, it doesn't matter. They were just simulating gathering this information, bundling it, and sending it up and up the chain. Really impressive uh, drill that I saw and the guys were really professional doing it. That's all I've got for today. I shared different scenarios, different levels of preparedness, gave you my thoughts. I've shared some of the things I've heard on air during an emergency and some of the drills I witnessed in person. Uh, I'm an amateur when it comes to all this radio stuff, so if I've missed something, overlooked, got something wrong, please disabuse me of my ignorance in the comments section. I would appreciate it. Until next time, I'm K4BBL73. I'm clear.